I want to thank you for tuning in to this worship service. Thank you so much for taking the time to dig into God's word with us. Here at Highview, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. And we'd love to invite you to come out to one of our services at one of our campuses. But we'd also love to, for you to check out Highview at highview.org. May you be blessed by our Lord as you dig into his word to know and follow Jesus. Guys, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. On chapter 10. Man, so good to see our choir back with us this morning. So excited for Yeah, come on. Isaac leading. Even though he puts that little delay there in that last song, he knows how impatient I am. You know, I'm ready to go. But it's exciting to sing the gospel with one another. Guys, we've been walking through John, and it's been amazing. God is just revealing himself over and over again. You know that we're in a section of what we call great tension. Our Lord Jesus has been revealing himself over again, over again with miracles and confrontation with the Pharisees. And the intensity will only increase all the way to the crucifixion. And there have been challenges upon him. And last week we saw that our Lord revealed that he is our good shepherd and that he has brought us into a relationship. This morning, we're taking a look at one of the great promises One of the great doctrinal promises that our Lord gives to us about our gift of salvation that is absolutely necessary for us to understand in a full dependence upon our Lord Jesus. So the honor of God's word, if you're able and willing, let's go ahead and dig in. John chapter 10, we're going to be in verses 22 through verse number 30. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the Father are one. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, Lord, once again, we humbly come before you. Lord, please open up our hearts and our minds to know you, to know your voice, to know whether or not we belong to you. Lord Jesus, may we truly believe. And Lord, may we understand the great gifts and promises that you give to us, your children. Lord, encourage us, give us confidence. Lord, may we be radically changed this morning because of your great promise to carry us all the way through. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Maybe seated. Here, in the context that's happening, we saw last week that there was a, a true confrontation, a rebuking of the Pharisees that took place at the beginning of chapter 10. Here, between that and this particular episode, about two months past, the Feast of Dedication is one that comes to be known as the Festival of Lights, or as we know it today, we know it as Hanukkah. And so there is a time of winter, a couple months have passed. Here comes, once again, a confrontation, verse number 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Once again, they are trying to corner him. Are you or are you not the Messiah? And what does Jesus say to them? He says to them in verse number 20, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Here, what is the issue? The issue is not one of evidence 
It's of belief. The Lord Jesus, throughout the book of John, throughout his interaction with the Pharisees, in the healing of the blind man, in the healing and in the miracles that he has done, he has called himself the light of the world. He's given a clarity about his identity. Their issue is they choose not to believe. They don't want to accept him. Why? Because they wanted an earthly Messiah. They wanted a Messiah that was going to free them from the bondage of Rome, that was going to usher in a new era of golden among Israel, they did not want what Jesus was bringing. He was bringing an eternal kingdom. He was bringing the kingdom of God. He was about to bring a greater gift, a more special gift. They did not understand that. They did not want to place their faith in him. They did not want to believe in him. Our Lord Jesus came to give us that which is greater, that which is better, that which we could never think or imagine. He came to give us an eternal kingdom so that we may be with him, not only in the here and now, but for eternity. Why is it that we have a tendency to want to settle for that which is temporal, that which is before us, and we don't understand the greater gift that our Lord wants to bring? That was the confrontation that's happening here. And he's given a clarity about evidence, but they choose not to believe, but he gives evidence of belief, beginning in verse number 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Our being a child of God, to be a sheep of his, means that we believe in him. And if we do not believe in him, we cannot know him. We cannot know his voice. We're not able to recognize the voice of God in and through his word. And we're certainly not in a relationship with him because that's what he's calling us into. He's calling us into not only hear his voice, but he says that I know them, that he's calling us into a personal relationship with him. And he gives us a clarity about that relationship. He says, and they follow me. We know from this, I've I've told you multiple again, I'm sure it surprises you to hear this phrase, to know and follow Jesus. I'm sure that's maybe new information for you out there. It shouldn't be. We are called to know and to follow, and to follow, you know. That word to follow means that we are called into a union with Christ, that we are to become like him, and that we are to be moving in the same direction. Our eyes are upon Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of faith. And in the midst of this, he gives one of the great descriptions. I love this. Verse number 28. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Let's break this down for just a minute. That phrase, I give them eternal life. I want to give you some some other scriptures to help really reinforce that because John has spoken to this already in John 1, verses 12 through 13. He says this, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Salvation is a gift eternal life that he presents to us is a gift we cannot produce on our own. No one here can save themselves. No one here can claim that gift on their own. It is a gift that is given to us by our Lord and it cannot be produced by our own will. It cannot be produced by a group of people of the will of man. It is done by the will of God that he places upon us, that he invites us into. Salvation is a gift that he gives to you and to me freely and willingly. He invites us in so that we may know his great gift of eternal life. We are born, born again. You're gonna hear that phrase later on in the sermon. Remember that phrase, we are called born again. The Lord's creating us and making us new in his kingdom. Then that second phrase is, they will never perish. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5, verses four through five says this, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Our Lord has come, and that's what eternal life is. That's what it means not to perish, that he's literally swallowing up our mortal life with his immortality. He is overcoming us, and we have now the Holy Spirit placed within us as a guarantee so that we may have 
assurance that we may have a guarantee that there is clear evidence that we belong to him, that this gift of eternal life is not something we're making up. This is not a fiction. This is the truth and that he has placed it upon us. He's invited us in and he's begun to literally dwell within us. But here's, it's an incredible gift, the greatest of gifts. The question is, can you lose it? Look at this next phrase. This is incredible. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Here's the phrase. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Mm. Verse number 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Our Lord has just given his children the ultimate promise. Not only is he making us new, being born again, but he is now sustaining us. We were born out of his grace. We are sustained by his grace and by his power and his mercy. He carries us all the way through to eternity, to him. And you cannot be lost. This is what's called eternal security. This is called the assurance of salvation. It's called the perseverance of the saints. It's multiple terms, but mean the same thing. Our Lord, what he has created, he will complete. He will fulfill. Look at the scriptures. Look at Philippians 1.6. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Then the great passage in Romans we've already taken a look at this morning. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from him because of his faithfulness, not ours. Even when we are faithless, he is faithful for he cannot deny himself. We're talking about the strength of our Lord. We're talking about the goodness and power of our Lord saying, I have you. Why is this so dear to us? Because we know our imperfections. We know our fallibility. We know that if it was dependent upon us and our track record, our history, no one could justify being in eternity with our Lord. No one. You, we learned these lessons early in life, but it was driven home for me once again through my own sons this week on the golf course. I know that surprises you, right? Super surprised. You know that I have sons who are really into the game of golf and I have to go with them, you know? I mean, like, someone's got to do it, right? Someone's got to pay the price. So I go with these guys and I experience two extremes this week. The first happened on Monday during a Fellowship of Christian Athletes tournament. Me, Pastor Scott, who's terrible, Pastor Blake, who's not very good, and my youngest, Porter Harvey. And who carried us all the way to victory? Porter Harvey. Because there was a hole, there were several holes. 
all three of the adults, right? Porter's 13. All the adults are putting it in out of bounds or in the water or whatever else. And I looked at him and said, Porter, it's all on you right now. And that kid goes, I got you, right? I mean, like this kid saved us, led us to victory, right? I mean, like there are moments when you realize someone else has to carry me. I can't do this. I don't have it. And someone else steps in and says, I have you. The other son, who should I name him? Luke Harvey. He's 20. We go golfing. And this kid has one of the most beautiful swings you've ever seen. Almost as pretty as him, right? <laughs> you can get that. You know, seriously, have you seen him? You know what I'm talking about. But he couldn't hit it straight if his life depended on it. I mean, like, I mean, we're on the tee. He's hitting it out of bounds like multiple times. And I mean, he's trying. I mean, like, that's the thing. He wants so desperately to hit it right and correct and down the middle. He can't do it. And there is so much anger and frustration in him. This is the experience we have in this world of brokenness. We want to do it right at times, but we can't. This is why we're so dependent upon this promise. We can't keep it, but he can. Remember, please don't forget that our Lord Jesus promises that we cannot be taken from his hand, his grip. Please don't forget the same hands that created the world, the same hands that hold you. The same hands who defeated Pharaoh are the ones who hold you. The same hands that parted the Red Sea hold you. The same hands that knocked down the walls of Jericho hold you. The same hands that gave David strength to defeat Goliath hold you. The same hands that defeated the Midianites in impossible odds hold you. The same hands that protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hold you. The same hands that helped Nehemiah rebuild the wall of Jerusalem hold you. The same hands that brought the Savior through the Virgin Mary hold you. The same hands that were nailed to a rugged cross to pay your debt hold you. The same hands that removed the stone and walked out of that grave hold you. He has you. And no one, do you hear the scripture? No one can take you from him. The Lord has you. If you belong to him, he has you. This is the great news. This is the great doctrine of assurance. This is the perseverance of the saints that's dependent upon him and his strength and his faithfulness. It's not dependent upon us. It's on him. And there's freedom in him. But that doesn't mean that there are not some objections. There's not, it doesn't mean that there's some doubt that rises up in your heart and your minds. I mean, when we deal with this great promise, there are some legit objections. Here's some that I wrote down up on the screen here for you. Number one, if God does it all and we cannot lose it, how can faith be genuine? Two, is assurance a license to sin? Three, does assurance contradict personal responsibility? These are hard questions. The first one, if God does it all and we cannot lose it, how can faith be genuine? Meaning, how can we enter into a real relationship with it? How can it actually be meaningful if the Lord does it all? I mean, am I not able to participate? This is the sovereignty of God and this is man's free will. I mean, which one is true? According to God's word, both are fully true. God's human, man's human responsibility, our free will is 100% true. God's sovereignty, according to God's word and election, is 100% true. How do they work? I don't have any idea. But God does. There's no contradiction in his heart and his mind. Tozer once wrote that God's sovereignty makes man's free will possible. How in the world does that work out? But our Lord sees no contradiction. They, there is no contradiction to him, and so we trust trust him. And that relationship that he forms is genuine. 
Let me take you back to your birth. Remember, when you were born, how much say did you have in that birth? None. But did that make it less genuine? No, the Lord gave you life and there was genuineness in that life. That's why we come back to this birth. Remember, what did, what did the Lord Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. Our Lord is doing a work we cannot do. That does not make it less genuine, but it does make it real. And he gives us life, makes us new. And in that newness of life, does that mean that we have a license to sin? No, no. You think you have this get out of free jail card? What are you talking about? Our Lord came to change us and transform us, make us new. The old passed away and the new has come. And if the Holy Spirit has been given to you, you are a follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you and you go and enter into purposeful, grievous sin. According to Ephesians, you are gonna grieve the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you lose the Holy Spirit, but you grieve him. And according to Hebrews chapter four, you will go undergo the discipline of the Lord. Why? Because he loves you. If you are a genuine follower of Christ and you belong to him and you go into grievous sin, you're going to be the most miserable person in the world. Our Lord does not give you some license to go and abuse grace. Thirdly, what does it mean of our, our own human responsibility? What does it mean for our participation is it less real? No. He calls us into a relationship. He just said, they hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. Our Lord graciously invites us into a real relationship where we are able to participate and experience his goodness and his grace. We're able to share with him our loyalty and our allegiance and our love that he places upon us. And it's a real relationship that our Lord gives to us. And the doctrine of assurance this should give us tremendous confidence. These are the outcomes. If you're writing, taking them notes. Here's some actual outcomes when it comes to this doctrine. Number one, there's confidence and comfort. Number two, there's conviction. And number three, there's courage. Let's break these down. Our Lord is telling us that we cannot lose him and he will not lose us. Gives us confidence. I mean, in a world that is broken and based upon our track record. I mean, we need confidence and we also need comfort. We need peace. Why? Because we know what it's like to mess up. We know what it's like to struggle. We know what it's like to lose our grip and lose confidence. There was a confidence destroyer for me when I was a junior high student and a high school student, because I grew up in the 80s and I had to face the dreaded rope in the gym. Does anyone have that? Did anyone grow up in the 80s, right? Kids today are soft, okay? I mean, we had the rope. You remember that rope? It was like 30 feet high and had a bell on top of it. And your gym teacher said, go, Harvey, go climb that rope, hit that bell and come back down. That was the most terrifying thing ever for a kid in ever in life. And I remember going up there, hitting that dumb bell and coming down and literally losing my grip, losing it and sliding down that rope, finally by some, by the Lord's miracle, catching myself at the end, literally leaving all of my skin on top, on that, on that rope. And I mean, remember getting up and bleeding. I've got stuff going on. And the coach says, here, I can hear you. Go. I got, I got a can of tough skin for you. And like, you know, you, wait, am I the only kid that grew up in the eighties? I mean, people come on tough skin, like go back in RV, right? I mean like, dude, losing your grip. We've all been there. And the Lord Jesus enters and says, I am with you. I have you. Have confidence. Have comfort. I'm allowing you to operate out of my own victory, which leads us to conviction. There's two different types of conviction. First kind of conviction, forms and shapes, meaning according to John chapter 16 and the role of the Holy Spirit, that he brings about the conviction of sin that our Lord does not leave us where we are, that he is in the process of changing and transforming us. And there's a conviction that leads us to be new, to be shaped and be formed. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say no, no to certain things and say yes to him, that our Lord wants to protect and guide us. And there is a conviction, literally a conviction of sin that shapes and forms. But there's also a conviction of foundation. That our Lord places within us his truth and places us our feet upon a rock, upon a firm foundation. And that brings a tremendous conviction a strength that we did not have before. 
That's the conviction our Lord wants us to stand upon his word and upon his truth and live life from a position of his foundation and his strength. So there's a conviction that shapes and forms, but there's also a conviction that gives us a firm foundation. And thirdly, there is courage. When we truly understand and believe in our Lord and his eternal security, it places courage within us. Courage to follow one faithfully. This is why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to stand before Nebuchadnezzar the king and in the midst and the, and the threat of death, were able to say to that king, let it be known to you today, no matter what happens to us, life or death, we are not gonna serve the idol that you have set up, but we, we are gonna serve the one true living God only. And they put their life on the line. But our Lord showed up. That courage comes from trusting him. But the courage also is the courage to lead others to Jesus, even in the midst of our failures. This is like Peter. Peter denied Christ three times. Our Lord restored him. And because of the confidence and conviction and the courage that he received from the assurance of our Lord Jesus, he was able to be restored and to lead others to Christ despite his failures. Think about that for a moment. Our Lord Jesus and his goodness and his grace overcome even our greatest mistakes in order to use us to be his great witnesses. Remember that passage from Hebrews 12, that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We're surrounded in a stadium full of witnesses. Those witnesses are not there for us to admire them. Their lives are there so that we admire Jesus. Our lives have got to be lived in such a way, even in the midst of failures, our Lord gives us courage to say, Lord, you have the power to forgive me. You have the power to restore me. And I believe his hand has you. He has you. And no one can take you from him. No matter what happens in this world, what difficulty you meet, no matter what mistakes you make, our Lord Jesus has given us a promise to those who truly believe. If you belong to him, he has given you the gift of eternal life. He has given you the promise you shall not perish. And he has given you a security you cannot possibly obtain on your own. He's given you a promise and the question is, are we living according to his great promise. Pray with me this morning, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, there are two types of people in this room. The first are those who have believed in the Lord Jesus and you, by the grace of our Lord, have become a child of God. Are you living according to his great promise? Are you living right now for the glory of the Lord Jesus? And are you living in light of his victory with confidence and comfort and peace? Are you living in the conviction of our Lord? Is there anything that needs to be confessed before our Lord? Letting him shape you and form you. Is there anything you know that you are called upon to take a stand upon? The truth of God's word. And are you living with courage? Man, are you following faithfully? Or are you leading others to Jesus? Man, this doctrine leads us to a greater trust in our Lord. Let's live for him. Then there are those who are in this room and you do not belong to Jesus. You've not believed. Our Lord, with those same hands that protect his children, are opening those hands to you in a great invitation. He's inviting you in. He is calling your name. Will you surrender to him? Will you believe that he truly is the savior of the world? Will you believe that there is salvation in no one else other than Jesus? Will you believe and become his child? 
He has the power to save you. Will you respond to him today? Lord Jesus, give us the strength this morning to truly believe and respond to you. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.